All right. Oh, there we go. I was screaming. <laughs> All right. I hope I can keep track of everyone that needs to talk. <laughs> um, hello, and welcome to the next to last session for DevNet Create. Uh, this is the Camp Create demo session. Um, all five of our teams are going to walk through um, what their experience was at DevNet or at Camp Create. Um, if you are just learning about Camp Create, it was our two day intensive, not hackathon, if build a thon, we'll call it, create a thon. Um, we had five teams that worked on five different use cases over the course of, of these two days. And now they're going to demo what they uh, built. They're going to talk about what they learned. Um, they're going to share their experience with you here. So I really appreciate everyone coming in and checking that out. They put in a ton of good work. And it's, um, I'm really excited to see what they've actually uh, built out here. Um, I do want to uh, note some special thanks to a few people. Um, I got a lot of help from uh, some of my colleagues, uh, Casey Bleeker, uh, John McDonough, uh, Ashley Roach, uh, Kareem Iskander, and uh, Stuart Clark helped us out for uh, hosts with the teams and really helped the teams succeed in getting things done that they can demo today. So some claps for them. Thank you. <laughs> we also had some uh, mentors that were with us. Uh, we had Mentesha. Um, whose name, last name is eluding me right now, so I apologize. Um, we had uh, Luis Meja that helped us out and Brad McAllister, so thank you guys for that as well. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Susie real quick. She's gonna say a few words and then we're gonna roll through to Mandy and then we'll, we'll get started. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I just wanted to take a minute to thank you all because uh, you are all here for Camp Create, uh, I saw that many of you had signed up early and you were some of the first ones to register and to really be dedicated to doing this. You chose to come here, spend your days coding. I know many of you actually wanted to be in the workshops too. Uh, so I know some feedback was that maybe we should separate this from the days we're having the workshop so that you can do both. But I just wanted to let you know that, you know, I've been following along. I know you guys have been doing amazing things and just thank you for everything that you've done here and participated and built. I'm sure you've been like pulling out your hair. I'm sure that you've built different things. I know you've worked as teams. I know some people are really advanced at coding. Some are beginners. And I know that the teams were all helping each other and encouraging each other. So thank you all for doing that as well. So I'm excited to see what you all built. And let's get the show on the road. But thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Oh, here. Introduce, ah, there we go, thank you. Uh, real quick, we want to introduce the panelists. So the teams are going to be presenting their solutions, and we've assembled a panel of developers, designers, industry experts, all kind of cross-functional roles to give feedback, ask questions, help the teams think about where they might take the projects next. So real quick, uh, just a couple quick introductions of the people on the panel. So. Starting with me, Mandy Whaley. I work for DevNet and lead our developer evangelism experience group. Um, Jose Obrin, I'm a chief innovation officer at Altus. I've been a networking engineer for 16 years and now a developer for four years. I'm Joel King of Worldwide Technology. I'm an architect there, network solutions team that focused on programmability and uh, engineering and innovation. I'm Sam Womack. Uh, I work at Worldwide Technology. Um, I'm a builder uh, in the business development team, and I like to make people uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sam. I'm Sam Hale, also a Sam. I'm an analyst uh, at Mock Nation. We're um, an IoT analyst firm, and uh, I like to do a lot of developer tasks for my job, so this is great. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Casey, Casey Town. So I probably met some of you over there in the design thinking booth. I'm from DevNet, and I'm a designer. So I'm very excited to see what you guys have put together. OK, I'm David I, and I'm a cheerleader for software development and software developer programs. I've been programming for 49 years, and I still program today. And I'm, I'm Zs Caravalla, uh, analysis ZK Research. I've been following Cisco's, uh, all their developer programs from years and years and years. In fact, I've judged uh, older 
the AXP Developer Contest. I've been a judge for, I think, F5's developer event, Avaya's, Twilio's, and a whole bunch of other ones. So I'm looking forward to seeing this. Thanks. Cool. Uh, thank you guys for uh, <coughs> doing this for us, providing feedback, all that is very helpful for the teams and for us to make this a better experience next time. So. Um, I did want to note all of our Camp Create attendees will be receiving this beautiful backpack for their efforts. Um, inside is a Meraki switch. <laughs> These are special for the Camp Creators, so if you didn't do Camp Create, don't ask for one. Inside is a Meraki switch with a three-year license. We got a bunch of those if you want one. So. <laughs> um, so I think that's everything from an administrative point of view. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Russell Pope from uh, Team Network Health Check Daily. Um, they're going to rock and roll, guys. Excellent. And then display, too, if you don't mind. Yay! So today I'm going to talk about uh, our Health Check tool. Uh, basically, our goal was to roll up a bunch of different data from a lot of different systems so we can have a better <laughs> picture of what's going on in the network. It kind of went away from being a daily thing and more of a real-time view, and we got a little lofty with some of our goals. So we've got a mobile app, we've got a web page, and we've got a VR client uh, all for this. Uh, part of the reason we, we didn't want to use something out of the box, like, hey, let's just use SolarWinds to collect all this data, is we felt like using some of the APIs, we could get more of a rich experience out of the devices, some of the counters that may not necessarily be easy to get to with baked-in SNMP polling and things like that. So I figured. We'd go ahead and open this up with a demo. So without further ado, everybody's eyes on the big board. And Pablo and Alexi, come on up. We're going to start with you guys. So we'll have Pablo go first. He's going to demo a mobile client that he wrote on Android. Doot, doot. Probably want to pop it up here. Huzzah. Somebody should probably reset that clock. Can you guys be sure to introduce yourself and say where you're from? Uh, sure. So my name is uh, Russell Pope. I work for a reseller here in the Bay Area. We do a lot of systems integration. Uh, the company is called Covaris. We're headquartered out of San Ramon. Uh, we do a lot of stuff around automation. Uh, that's big, been our big go-to-market for the last several years. Uh, network programmability is very near and dear to our heart. Uh, so this was a particularly interesting project for me. So as soon as I saw Camp Create came, came into existence, I was like, well, let's sign up and see what happens. Uh, worst, worst come to worst, I will have a demo that falls over and dies in a very spectacular way. Uh, we don't think that's going to happen today. So Pablo's got a, his Android client here. He's actually going to be demoing off of his phone. So different folks uh, have different things they want to see uh, when it comes to getting a report on the daily status of their stuff. Like the CIO doesn't care that a line card is dead in a 7K somewhere in a data center. He just cares if the business is still making money. So when he, the CIO clicks on it, he gets information about like his SLA violations, and it looks like the back end must have gone belly up. Oh, Pete. <laughs> uh, but you can see some of the mock-ups in the background while, while Pete goes and checks into that, where we're actually able to say, oh, OK, well, Mr. CIO, you know, all your locations are green, yellow, or red. And there's also a section to talk about your SLA compliance. So you know, if you happen to be caring about that kind of thing, the CIO is going to get that. As you go into the directory, you're going to get more location-specific things. Uh, for example, individual sites, devices that are up or down, or et cetera. Manager, we get a little bit further down. And then we could continue to drill down and down and down. Uh, as needs dictate. How are we looking on our? It's up. Well, let's jiggle the handle. Uh, uh, uh. Come on, Ralphie. The demo <laughs> gods are very unkind. That's how we know it's live demo. Exactly. Right? That's great. We're not playing any videos here. <laughs> not like some other teams. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I got. I got to lay that out early, just in case. Checking one last thing, and then Alexia, is your stuff working still, or? Uh, come on. Well, you're using Microsoft Edge. That's the problem. That is a problem. Typing the super secret password, making sure the back end is alive. <laughs> that looks good. Checking the other thing. Basic, and then I did Pascal and then Portman. I did some co 
We promised this was all working like 45 minutes ago. <laughs> So I guess while he's digging through that, uh, go ahead and flip to uh, display two. I'll go ahead, so in the interest of saving time, while these guys do some troubleshooting, and we'll come back to the demos. Uh, that works. No, 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 I was talking to Chris. If you could swap to display two while we... Oh, wait, no, never mind. I just need to steal this. Derp. I'll blast through some methodology while I do some quick troubleshooting here. So uh, we use a lot of different tools here. Uh, GitHub, obviously, easy for everybody to collaborate. Uh, that way, you know, didn't matter where we were. I didn't need to have anybody VPN anywhere. And then we actually made our Git repo public, so if anybody wants to go download all of our code, you're welcome to do it. And tell us how shoddy and terrible it is. Uh, we use Trello to organize our work. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Trello. It's just a basic task management tool out there. You can set up a Kanban board in there create all your cards and just track them through the life cycle. And that was pretty important because, you know, our team is distributed uh, all over the place. Uh, I think Paraguay, uh, Russia, somewhere on the East Coast. Hmm? Ukraine, I'm sorry, Ukraine, not Russia, uh, et cetera. And we basically, uh, after we did that, we were able to take a pretty modular approach. Just we had all these different pieces and parts that we wanted to uh, put together. So we're just like, okay, Alexi, you work on this. Russell, work on this. Pete, work on this. Pablo work on this. It made it really, really easy. Before we could really start, we had to answer some questions. One, how, how do we collect the data? <coughs> what data do we actually need? And then once we have that data, what do we do with it? I mean, you know, it's one thing to pull an interface counter or an interface state and say, oh, it's down. But do I care if it's down? Do I flag on that or not? So we had to figure out ways of, 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 of dealing with that and saying, oh, okay, well, that's definitely unhealthy or that's normal behavior. Don't worry about it. And then we might have to do some transformation of that data like some, some APIs might return a timestamp, for example, in, in a Unix format, and you don't want to use it that way. I know that was a challenge the team next to us ran into. Maybe it comes back in a percentage. Maybe it's like some of the Cisco devices where it's a percentage, but it's out of 255, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we had to figure out how to present that in a meaningful way to the user. So this is a rough design uh, schematic for what we built. And I'll start at the bottom and work my way up. So we built a bunch of different connectors for all the different APIs and devices we might need to talk to. These are all written in Python uh, to make it nice and easy. So we have one connector that collects data from the Meraki API, another one from DNA Center, and then we didn't actually get a chance to start on it, but we would build a hardware collector to go and collect data from like just bare metal uh, to fill in some of the gaps that we didn't uh, cover with DNA Center. We bring all that up and then we front end that with a Django API, so we abstract all those different APIs into one bigger API. And then we have a data services and transformation layer, which is responsible for doing a few things. For example, when we collect data from Meraki, we noticed that uh, we ran into a uh, rate limit on the API. Maybe we're being a little too aggressive, uh, but we're like, well, we, we need to cache this uh, because we don't need to go and get all the same data all the time. Uh, we were, wanted to do InfluxDB to collect some metrics, but uh, we never got to that point. And then we kind of mocked up some trouble ticketing stuff. So for SLA measurement, MTTR measurements, things like that. We'd use ServiceNow as a source of truth for that. Once, once we got all that stuff straightened out, a lot of that uh, data services is written in Node.js. Then we have the dashboard services, which Pablo and Alexi worked on, uh, that provided like the browser client, the thick client, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the VR awesomeness that uh, he's hopefully gonna showcase here shortly. Uh, one of the nice things about our notification services engine is it really allows us to plug in anything, chat ops, uh, Lambda, Iron I.O., serverless, all that jazz. Some other tools for our uh, VR element, we're using Unity 3D, which it looks like I see that's working on the screen, so we'll at least be able to demo that piece. Uh, Unity 3D with a lot of C-sharp, we use that so we can get the Oculus data into Oculus Rift so you can actually see uh, where all the failures are. Uh, we, like I so said, we use Django, and we had extra time. One of the cool use cases was if you see a particularly obnoxious client out there being able to shoot them in VR and drop them off the network or something like that. It'd be kind of a cool way to gamify your <coughs> security operations. Uh, it'd be nice if we could put an elk stack alongside this to collect events from all your devices, and then maybe we can have some intelligence to kind of scrape through that log data and do something interesting with it uh, in top NG or something like that to pull in all the net flow data. And these are all stretch goals. We didn't get a chance to do that. You know, just, hey, if there's a BGP neighbor defined and it's not there anymore, 
Should probably throw a red light on the dashboard. And some more detailed drill downs. Uh, more on tools, we used Android Studio and Java to build the mobile client. Uh, and that's all reaching back to our back end in Node.js. And some key findings. Uh, I'm not as happy to report that the DNA Center APIs are not great. Uh, we found that none of the data we needed existed in them. Uh, and some of the stuff we actually had to go resort to engineering, giving us some undocumented calls that aren't in any way publicly available. Uh, we also ran into a similar problem with Meraki, where it's great for provisioning and building stuff, but it's not so great for operating it, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting uh, in Meraki, because your management plane is dashboard.meraki.com, but if I want to integrate that in with like SolarWinds or something else, how do I get that data in there uh, through that API? And I wasn't able to do that. Uh, the best I could get for health and metrics on Meraki was basically uh, a uh, WAN uplink status. Uh, some of the documentation we found was a little wrong or outright wrong. Uh, so we reversed engineered some Cisco code samples to figure out, like, for example, authentication with DNA Center's API, because we tried the documented way and that didn't really work out well for us. Uh, which gets back to the docs are out of date, metrics aren't there, uh, rate limiting, et cetera. Uh, Meraki API would be nice if they added a field in here. So if you look, this is, oop. Sorry, this doesn't have a laser pointer. If you look at the response, the first line on the right here, this is DNA Center's response for a device. We see it's a router, and I know it's a router. Oh, good. So I, I can say, oh, okay, well, I can determine that's a router, and I don't have to do any kind of tomfoolery. The left is a Meraki response, and unless I know Meraki model numbers, uh, I can't tell if that's a router, a switch, an access point, or whatever. Uh, I've actually already submitted that feedback back <coughs> to some folks uh, in the Meraki BU, so hopefully they'll be adding that. He didn't uh, think that was... Uh, too terrible to ask. We started, as we started working with the VR stuff, we got into this whole notion of like a, a virtual reality knock. I mean, you can never have enough TV screens and monitors in a knock. And so why not just give somebody an Oculus Rift or something like that, and then you can have all the monitors, displays, and data shown at them uh, that they want, and even be able to take some you know, remediation action. Let's, let's go run an Ansible playbook from here or something like that. Uh, we learned a lot about WebSockets. Uh, we needed that so that we can hook up uh, our, our 3D engine to, uh, to Meraki. Uh, and of course, the most important thing is we all had a blast doing this. I will do this again next year, uh, even if everybody mocks me on my way out of the door. Uh, some things we might do different, probably would have punted the ball sooner on Meraki, but we didn't know what we didn't know, so we wanted to check, double check, triple check, and make sure that we didn't actually have the stuff in there that we needed. Uh, I think it would have been cool if we had like a dedicated viral environment uh, with some routers and switches and all that stuff available for us to use as, as part of the lab. Uh, sandbox is great, but all of us were hammering the same systems in the sandbox, and so like if we broke something on the Meraki, it would affect another team, uh, and that really wasn't great, uh, and more pre-flight checks. And then I'll go through the team, and then we'll do the demos, and then I'll get off the stage, because I've been up here probably far too long. So Pablo worked primarily on our front end, uh, all the mobile app stuff. Alexi worked on the web client, uh, which you'll be seeing both of these things here very shortly. Pete did all the back end, or all the middleware work, and he also did the uh, VR front end. And of course, I just sat around yelling at my screen a lot, uh, trying to fight Meraki and DNA Center APIs, uh, and writing some mock test harnesses. And if you guys want to look at the code, almost all of it's there, because Pete has not yet committed his code into my Git repo, and so I'm going to scold him and mock him thoroughly. Uh, that being said, it looks like we're good, so, we're going to give the magic rope to Pablo. And then we'll do an abbreviated demo. Uh, still display two. I think that's two, yeah, yeah that's two. Whoop. There we go. Perfect. A lot of us use IntelliJ tools. So there's the CIO dashboard. You can see basically uh, we got about a quarter of our devices are dead. Another quarter have some warning states on them. And then the other half look perfectly peachy. Uh, you can see you can spin it around there. Uh, of course, he can back up. And then if he logs in as the director, you'll see that he's probably more caring about his trouble ticket metrics. Again, we just pull this from whatever, ServiceNow, Remedy. Et cetera. And we'd like to be able to add drill downs to this, but you know, 
time being what it was and going through a lot of science experiments and learning, we weren't able to do that. And if you see the manager, he gets a view of basically his WAN availability. Uh, but again, we can reflect anything in there. We could even go down to individual device drill downs if we wanted to. We just didn't have time to slap that code together. So you could pull up, like, a lead might care about port 17 on a 48 port switch. So uh, with that, let's pop in Alexis and then, uh, and then we'll do the Tempani for the uh, VR piece and then we'll get off the stage. This lightning talk has gone through a little bit of molasses. All right, so, oop, uh, still display two. Uh, so we get a lot of the same data here. Uh, we got more stuff on the, uh, on the page, though. CIO's health report, and then if you click on, like, the director again, you're going to see more uh, data there that's specific. You know, we figure a lot of managers and things like that, they're looking for more context to wear dashboards. Like, the engineer that lives in the NOC, he cares about counters. The director just cares if the service is up, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, here's the manager, and he's got his latency by average that we pulled in from... Uh, probably my test harness if I was a betting man, uh, because we couldn't find that data anywhere in data, DNA Center, even though they have a really awesome dashboard called Assurance. None <coughs> of it's in the API, uh, which was kind of upsetting. Now we can go to display one and start to roll the Tampani drum uh, as Pete gets up here, fires up his VR client. This thing is pointing at the DevNet sandbox, so you'll actually see what he's seeing uh, right here. Each one of these red boxes is actually... Uh, got a latitude and a longitude assigned to it, but pulled out of Meraki's API. So if we were to put a map of the world underneath there, you would see like San Francisco, you would see RTP, and you would see those red boxes all represent dead access points in the DNA Center sandbox. Unfortunately, we couldn't find anything alive in the, or not DNA Center, in the Meraki uh, sandbox for DevNet. Uh, so everything looks dead. Uh, we actually did a quick test in, a, in one of our production environments, and we were able to see like green things, so we promised that it works. But, uh, you know, one of the cool things is because we're able to now get data from all of our devices into here, we can actually put things like, we can make the boxes bigger or smaller based on the utilization of interfaces, how many clients are on there, et cetera. And I see he's playing me off. So thank you, everyone. So I appreciate it. Hopefully this was uh, good for you. Don't forget to close all your dirty movies. Yeah, I got a couple. Um, uh, Russell, Pete, yeah, uh, hang out just for a minute to answer some questions. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you coming back up? All right. So, um, uh, given all the data you're capturing, what what kind of uh, notification capability do you have? So, if something falls below a certain threshold or whatever, can you push to Slack? Can you alert through the app? Something? Yeah, so we can do like a web look, uh, something like that. We didn't actually get a chance to implement that, uh, but yeah. I mean, basically everything is really modular. The notification module, it sees an event come in, and then we just trigger some arbitrary Python code to do something. Like, we thought about pushing into our Spark room. Uh, we just didn't get a chance to implement that. Yeah, and then um, how much historical data do you keep, or is it meant for real time? So we actually keep a fair amount of historical data because one of the things we were hoping to get to, uh, because we wanted to make sure, like, if an interface is showing down, we have a historical data of it being up to decide if it's going to be flagged as a fault. So we wanted to try and keep as many snapshots of the network as we possibly can. We're using uh, Mongo uh, to store a lot of that state data. So, right. Well, and that was my next question around. Uh, if you keep historical stuff, uh, obviously that would, you could, uh, if you see something like an interface go down X time, number of times in a certain, right, you could identified as chronic or something like that, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. One, one question. What information were you trying to get from DNA Center or Meraki <coughs> that you couldn't? So what could I get from DNA Center that I couldn't get from Meraki? Or yeah. what you said that you wanted to get some information, but you couldn't get that information from DNA Center or Meraki. So what yeah. information were you trying to get? Uh, so for example, on Meraki, I wanted to get... Uh, uh, a list of uh, sites, subnets. Things like that, just general so, infrastructure information. Uh, so which, couldn't. we could get that out of Meraki, but we couldn't get that out of DNA Center. Uh, and then like in DNA Center, I, I would have liked to have gotten, because DNA Center is tracking a lot of that health data. So if I could have just retrieved that information from there, it could have made our jobs a lot easier. Uh, 
like and like the path tracing and all that stuff, but none of that stuff was exposed through the API. I mean, we could have cheated and loaded an iframe, but where's the fun in that? Uh, and I can sit with you and like we can go through line by line all of our code, and I could show you where like I had an expectation for a thing to be there, and it wasn't, uh, or it was arranged in a really weird way. So I see that it's pretty cool that you incorporate VR into your project. Can you tell me a little bit more about the decision? Is that because it's cool to edit it, or are you trying to address any specific scenario there? It was cool. It was kind of the first piece. Uh, as we started building on it, it started turning into that, like that notion of a virtual knock. Uh, you know, we just kind of laid everything out based on geo, but I mean, if you could just have like 37 different displays with like high level dashboards and then maybe your top command over here that's running and maybe like a NetFlow collector over here and you could just look around, that started to like be like really appealing to me. What about AR instead of VR? Much as I love VR personally, it sounds like if you could do AR, you walk into a, you know, a closet or a rack somewhere, you hold up your device and it shows you, you know, real time, green light, red light across the board. I like that. I like that. I am totally stealing that and claiming it as my own. You're welcome. <laughs> Nobody heard me say that. <laughs> so. Uh, we timing here. Um, so can uh, I have the crowd checker slash uh, Spark public announcements team come up? Uh, we could come on up and get set up here. Um, so this team was ac actually a a group that had come together. We originally had six use cases. Um, but you know, personnel and all those things being considered, we had to combine one team into into uh, or two teams into one. Um, so these guys will be running through a scenario where they are um, checking crowds in an area, uh, determining whether or not uh, I want to go to a place if it's super crowded or not, um, and then being able to reach out to the people in that space in potentially uh, emergency situations. So um, as soon as they're ready to go. Uh, what are you guys looking for here? Oh, you don't have a VGA adapter. <laughs> That's why I wanted you guys to come in and do the tech check. Um, do you have a VGA adapter? Oh, have one right here. To dis not to display port. That's display port. Yeah, you need, they need a VGA actual cable. HDMI to VGA then. <laughs> okay. All right, you guys are just going to have to talk about it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, we'll do the hand mics. Yeah. <laughs> here, here, uh, here are the hand mics here. Uh, actually, um, yeah. Okay, if you guys can move it to another machine. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we'll we'll let this team head off, and then uh, we'll have. So it was ne network health or network health check? Did you do? I'm trying to remember who was in the order there. Oh, it's uh, roll call. Yeah. They can't see the SSIDs that they created in here. <laughs> All right. We're doing it live, people. Okay. Well, actually, so we will skip that. Are you guys ready? All right. Why don't you guys come up? We'll figure out what their technical issue is. Yeah, we can do that. All right. We're going to skip all the way ahead to our fourth team. <laughs> she has her dongle ready. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Yeah. yeah okay. So uh, this team right here, here are the mics. Thank you. Um, this team right here is working on retail analytics. Uh, they're doing a combination of Spark and Meraki integrations as well. Um, I'll let them get set up, and then we shall move forward. Uh, this is now the fourth team. They're doing retail analytics, retail stat bot. They took a little bit of an adjustment to their use case, and they will talk about that as part of their uh, presentation here.
Uh, just unplug it and plug it back in. All right, go ahead and switch it over. Yeah, plug it back in. There you go. We thought. Always a challenge when we're jumping between teams. Perfect. There you go. All right, cool. I think it's uh, not getting okay. near. No, no, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. You can see it right in front of you, oh. Tiffany. Perfect. You just need to mirror your device. Just mirror. Go to settings and hit me. Yeah, I have my phone in my pocket. Yep. All right. So let's press play. And you're going to kick it off. And all right. Uh, Woo! All right. <laughs> Do you want me to drive while you talk? Uh, sure. Hi, everybody. We are Team Bank Ability. And uh, our uh, goal was to provide a solution that gives customer services superpowers to uh, banks. So specifically, uh, our solution is geared towards improving customer services in the financial services sector by using retail location analytics. Wait, why do you need the CDSS ID in there? It's for the captive portal. Oh, shit. Sorry? You got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. No worries. All right. Next. Yeah. No, our slides are not. Uh, it's cropping off the... Uh, oh, it's cropping them? Yeah, it's cropping off our... Black background. <laughs> <laughs> Just hit escape and, and uh, yeah, that's okay. Okay. That's not the deck. Yes. Just go to Google Drive and, and pull it up there. Sorry about that, guys. Just open the presentation right there. Yeah, that's fine. All right, we can work, work with that. All right, great. Um, yeah, go on to the third slide, please. <laughs> All right, so our team, my, uh, first of all, I want to thank our mentor, Kareem. So where are you, Kareem? So, <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Uh, provided us excellent mentorship. Myself, uh, uh, my name is uh, Nick Kalyani. I'm the co-founder and CTO of a startup called WenHub, doing crazy things uh, on the blockchain. Um, also, uh, I have uh, Dennis, who is a data scientist. Uh, and next, we have uh, Eric, who uh, came all the way from South Africa. So uh, he had uh, a long journey there. And then there's Tiffany, who is a uh, product manager at Cisco. So um, what we built, uh, go ahead to the next, <clears throat> to the browser. Yep. All right. So uh, what we've built is a web portal. Uh, and uh, essentially, the portal is designed to aggregate multiple products as we build upon them. And today, we are going to show you three of the products that uh, we have built. But before uh, I go uh, into those, I want to talk a little bit about our workflow process. So uh, if I could steer, please. Uh, yep. So uh, first of all, the architecture. Uh, basically, our app consists of uh, the front-end web app, which was a, a Node Express uh, app with Vue.js. And uh, we have an API, and we incorporated uh, web sockets in there for some of the stuff that you're going to see. Uh, our primary hardware that we interacted with uh, via API was, uh, was uh, Meraki. And we also built uh, some, uh, uh, a, a bot client with, 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 for, for Spark. Now, I want to show you the, the requirements we, 
worked on prior to actually starting building? Just open. Uh, it's not letting me close it. Oh, yeah. See this cape? So uh, what we did was we essentially defined uh, uh, what our who our customer was and uh, what the specific demos we wanted to to work on. Um, then we uh, actually for each of our products we went into who the specific actor was and what what uh, specific uh, tasks they would be performing for the demo, and uh, we really uh, went down more into detail then. And for each of them, we we specified exactly what the API endpoints were, what the payloads were that were to be returned, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, kind of what got us going, and. Um, uh, next, uh, what I want to show you is the first app within this suite, and that app is called a Teller Director. So the idea here is that uh, we want to provide a solution that helps bank managers optimize the use of tellers because they have a limited budget and they have a limited number of tellers, and what we want them to do is to make sure that there's a teller on duty when customers are most likely to walk in into the bank location. So the way we approach that is uh, to look at historical data and create heat maps. So what, uh, what in this UI, what a bank manager can do is essentially uh, pick, pick a date and uh, play back what happened on that particular date in terms of the motion of people within the bank location. And they can go and look at it at a particular time, et cetera, and they can do it for another date uh, also. And uh, the, the next part of this vision, which we weren't able to fully execute, but we'll talk about how we're going to do it, is for them to do what-if scenarios with tellers. So what if there had been four tellers that day instead of three? What would the traffic have uh, looked like, uh, and uh, how would it have minimized the wait time for, for customers? So to talk about how we would work on that back end and, and the, the process we went through, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis. To, to see when customers were in the actual retail location, or in our case, a bank, uh, typically you'll have a uh, Wi-Fi or ideally a Meraki port with a beacon somewhere. Um, at a bank, usually the Wi-Fi is in the back with the offices, um, which is kind of close to the teller line. So we kind of envisioned a scenario where you have an existing um, access point there, and then you can add a beacon somewhere close to the front door. So you can uh, get a ping off of customers walking in, and then you can get another ping when they actually get to the teller line. So with that, you can tell how long they're in the bank, how long their wait time is, um, how many people are in the bank. And so we uh, built a uh, Python simulation environment to simulate randomly assign the type of transaction or the length of the transaction different customers were going to experience, and then um, kind of pseudo-randomly assign how many people are walking into the bank throughout different times, going off of um, the times that they typically, you typically see more people, like around lunchtime and a little bit more at the end of the day. Pretty cool. And um, That's pretty cool. running that, we could change the number of tellers and also have tellers go off shift, so you don't have to have a teller there the whole time. You can send one to lunch for an hour or things like that. And uh, with uh, what we thought was a typical branch scenario, smaller branch, um, you basically need, um, you can kind of get by with five tellers if you really have to, but you have a lot of customers left over at the end of the day in some situations. You really need at least seven tellers in a medium-sized branch. And so with something like this, you can run different what-if scenarios and see on which days or in which situations the combination of tellers you have is understaffed. Right. And then I'm going to actually walk through the ZipBot, which was um, using back. our Work Cisco Spark that. bot. Uh, I'm going to uh, actually toggle right. over to Spark real quick. Um, just make this a little bit bigger. OK. So with the bot, how you can interact with it. <laughs> the microphone. Um, if you say hello to the bot, it will give a response. Should give a response. 
or not? It was working before. You gotta, you gotta add it. Oh, oh. yeah, add sign, yeah. Sorry. There we go. Sorry, I was in the personal room before, so I didn't have to do the at. Um, and then you would select your options in terms of the transactions that you would want to do. So I'm going to just do randomly um, number two. No, you got to add box. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was so much easier when I was doing it in my personal room with, with it. Um, let me do that. OK, there you go. And then what we do is we uh, have a scheduler that comes up to give them an indication of when um, is the best time to come in. So the optimal time is in indicated in green, and the time that's a little bit less convenient is in orange. And if you wanted to go back and do other um, commands within the bot, you can do something like help. So It'll give you um, a response back to customer service. All right, thank you. All right, moving along. So that's two of the three solutions. And now the, the last one we want to talk about is called VIP Sense. So we saw Teledirector, we saw ZipBot. So VIP Sense is, in effect, uh, an app that is working under the hood. Uh, it doesn't come alive until uh, a VIP, uh, you know, uh, someone who's important to the bank, walks in the door. So what happens then? is essentially anyone who is in the bankability portal at that time, uh, they will see that VIP's profile uh, show up. So we don't have a Meraki uh, device here. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to switch over to my browser. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and switch to this page. And we'll have Tiffany be the VIP. You are a VIP. So, uh, and you can see that uh, it, it uses WebSockets there. And, uh, it just shows up right there. So, um, and it's it's designed to to ignore the repeated pings that you're going to get from that device. It is also designed to allow you to drill down and, and look at perhaps what is the purpose of the visit, when was your last visit, or their history with the bank, et cetera. So the idea is that uh, the most important customers for your bank, they don't spend any time waiting around. The moment they approach the door, they get in. Uh, you have someone greet them and, and already know who they are and, and what, what they're there for. So that's uh, uh, the, the VIP sense. So that's three different uh, 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 components within the, the portal. So let's go back here. All right. So um, I think that's about it for... That's, that's uh, basically yeah. our presentation. Yeah. I'm happy to take any, any questions. Okay. <laughs> So I have a quick question. Um, so obviously, in this particular case, you're trying to leverage wireless to identify people and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But the one thing banks already have quite a lot of are cameras. And obviously, out of the scope for what you could do in this period of time, but what about trying to rework it so that you're using facial recognition, either for identifying individual customers or for just identifying traffic flow over time by reusing the existing video feeds that are in banks, but then with the same idea? I think that's a great idea. Thank you for that suggestion, and which is why we don't look at this as a monolithic solution. It's a portal into which we would want to plug in different technologies as they evolve. And also, keep in mind that banks are among the most conservative of all, all customers. So you want to give them an opportunity to have a portal where they can perhaps turn on services, turn off services. But I love the idea of, a, of facial recognition. I think it would, it would be an excellent plug-in for this portal. So, hi. Hi. So I'm a big fan of proximity beacons and also GPS and a combination. <laughs> and if the customer's got a mobile phone with an app and they say, I'm coming, you can track them all the way and know who they are and know when they walk in the door and escort them in a sense, like go to room two. Uh, I was just curious if you thought about the combination of GPS outdoor and indoor proximity and the knowledge you have about the person through a, an app to uh, customize or optimize the solution. A absolutely. So you said a couple of words there that probably raise fear in the hearts of most people, which is track being one of them. So uh, 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 that would be the one concern I would have about implementing such a solution. But uh, the other aspect of it is you'd, we'd want 
technology to be invisible to the user, where they don't have to do anything and, and really be passive about it. And, and the technology enables the people who are supposed to serve them and empowers them to do what they need to do. But I, I love the idea of perhaps augmenting some of this where uh, if you intend to spend more than a few minutes, perhaps you have a larger transaction, you're coming in for a mortgage or something like that, uh, there would be some interaction there that would allow you to be prepared up front and also have the bank be prepared up, up front. So thank you. It's like open table for banks. Something like that, yeah. Did you, we, we also uh, talked about what if we just built this into an app. Um, with an app, if you're using the app, then of course, you can get information off of that user. But somebody else walking into the bank, um, the majority of people we assumed wouldn't have the app or at least have it uh, active in the background. So we wanted to have, a, a for some of the functionality, a way to see how many people were coming into the bank. And you know, pretty safe assumption that most people will have a phone on them, um, especially when they're doing their banking. Yeah. Now, you, you use this to kind of optimize the number of tellers. Where I've seen retailers use something like this is to uh, change the the design of their store, right? So if you understand how people, the path people take, mm -hmm. you can move stuff around, Absolutely. put ads, and did you think about you know showing that type of display versus just a heat map? Yeah, I, I think that that would be be great. I mean, we had you know to less about 24 hours yeah. to to build something, so we had to <laughs> pick something. And also, actually, you know, that leads to my, my the the point I wanted to close out with is in these kind of events when we have to build something, oftentimes teams will get together and build something for the sake of building something. We really wanted to step back and look at it from a customer-centric uh, uh, you know, viewpoint. We wanted to think about it uh, as a product. What is the brand? What does it speak of? What is the vision? How will it evolve? Will the customer that is going to buy this actually pay for it? Uh, will they want to use it? And those kind of things. So. Uh, we spent time on that too, besides the technology, and, and we didn't want to go too far off the path and stay, stay focused on our retail retail client here. Of course, malls, et cetera, are retail, but in this case, we picked the financial sector and wanted to stay focused on. All right, oh, that's... Just, uh, just let me... If, oh. if I, yeah? Wait, yeah. okay. No, no, don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> are you sure? Yeah, just... Uh, only was in suspense. I have to build an application like this one, so I have two features that you might think about it. The first one, it's actually... Um, Managing the Bluetooth beacons using the Meraki APIs, okay. which are you know are available for that, and the second part in the VIP sense, if you know that customer, you, then you can send a post attention survey, like a, a Net Promoter Score. Say, do you recommend our service to other customers? So you can send that information through their email or something like that once they visit the the branch. Yeah, that's great. Follow up is always a good thing to to figure out if you've been delivering the services your customers want. So thank you for that. Thanks, so. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Um, come on up. Next team. Um, I'm going to give them a break. So, yeah, if you guys are ready, come on up. <laughs> uh, we're doing, like I said, we're doing this live. So, um, the next team up is the, uh, the Crowd Checker slash uh, Park Spark Public Announcements. And... Um, I think we've got it all set up now where they're able to do their demo and share it. You guys all right? Okay. Who? We take for granted how, you know, when you set your thing to mirror displays. <laughs> but when you're at home, you always do the extended display. So, and, woohoo. Ah, oh, there we go. Who's, who's going to be talking here? Here you'll be the, the mic manager. Here, David. All right. Yeah, they're on already, so go ahead. <laughs> all right. How are we all doing today? <laughs> Good. Apologize for the technical di difficulties, but I, 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 uh, 
I assume that uh, we're all used to it. Um, so as you can see, we are the Spark Public Announcements and Crowd Checker Group. Uh, my name is Forrest Weinberg. Uh, I work for uh, CDW. I am a, uh, one of the network engineers and um, based out of LA. Uh, flew up here for a couple days to have some fun with um, everybody here. Um, I'm going to let everybody else introduce themselves. I think it'd be better off that way. Um, we have our mastermind, uh, Morty. <coughs> Morty. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, my name is Murthy. I'm a um, um, uh, CEO for Indomos Technologies, and um, uh, API Bot uh, is a company that I'm building right now. It's a, it helps you to generate applications, and the development process reduces the development process um, about um, 50%. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Greg Yost. I'm a uh, network consulting engineer at Cisco, and I've worked in the UC and UCC practices, and I'm currently doing application consulting. Hi, my name is Miguel. I, I came from Portugal, Europe. Uh, I'm a senior software developer, and um, basically I'm here to help and to have fun, and it, it was a great time to, have, to be here. I'm Tessa Merrill, and I am from Cisco DevNet, and I'm one of the mentors, along with Casey Bleeker, uh, for the team. Thanks, Casey. He's right back there. Come on, man. So far. And I'm uh, Dave Donahue. I am a uh, developer for a consulting firm in San Diego that does mostly Ruby on Rails, mobile and web development. And, and uh, just if you're curious, uh, these avatars, that we pulled those directly from Spark, and um, Casey's, that's actually Casey's avatar that we decided to mirror up on David and Morty because they didn't decide to upload theirs. My long lost twin. <laughs> Anyways, so this problem statement right here, um, this, this statement definitely evolved uh, throughout our process. I'm not um, going to uh, lie to you guys. Uh, it started off one way, um, even when we were discussing it. Um, during our planning process, it literally evolved 10 different ways, um, and I'm sure we're all used to this. And then even deeper or it, it, deeper into the development process, it also um, it kind of changed again. Um, so the ultimate uh, problem statement that we came up with was, um, you know, the, the, the most organizers, uh, event organizers such as Cisco, uh, the DevNet like this, or some of the workshop organizers, um, they have no way to track uh, uh, any um, people going to their, to their uh, events. Um, so with, with that, um, they, 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 they're lacking the actionable data, and then organizers are, 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 are they, they, with this data, they'll be able to plan for the future events as well, uh, better off, you know, whether that be if one event or one uh, specific topic was more popular than the other, um, then maybe we can ax one and uh, it, it add some more topics uh, within that popular one. So our, our solution uh, lever leveraged a few different um, technologies. Uh, the, main, the, main, the main specific ones were the Meraki API. Um, with that, we were able to gather up a lot of uh, raw uh, location data from all the different um, users here on site. Uh, as soon as one uh, a user would, uh, uh, they, don't, they don't even need to connect to the Meraki network. Uh, it still pulls their information, and we can use that uh, for our app. Um, we have some analytics running in the background uh, determining which were, which were the most popular events. Uh, and then we also uh, developed a web dashboard to display those top events, some trends, and a uh, heat map. And then we also developed a SparkBot to go ahead and um, kind of we, we, we were also kind of envisioning a global event kind of spark room. Um, and that's what our, this bot was supposed to be. Uh, he would be running that, that, that uh, global event room and users would be able to kind of join in and, and ask our, uh, we didn't necessarily get to it, uh, uh, but he is, he is working, but there's, there's some more functionality that, 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 I, that would go into there. Go ahead. So here's some of the technologies that we used. Um, obviously, we talked about Meraki and then Cisco Spark. Uh, Java was huge. 
Uh, that was our, our guy Miguel back there. He did a lot of that uh, backend database uh, with Java. Uh, we leveraged a lot of the Node.js and, and the libraries that are available there. Um, Postgres, uh, SQL was the database. Uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. We leveraged uh, uh, Amazon to deploy our code out um, into the uh, wild and uh, expose those APIs. Um, and then API bot, um, that's, that's what we have, uh, Murthy here, and Angular, that was uh, kind of our front end. So like I was telling you, um, the planning phase, uh, that did evolve. Um, we, we, we kind of finally drilled down and determined that, that business case. And once we were able to uh, determine that business case, uh, we were able to get that architecture going. We kind of felt uh, better going with what we were familiar with. Each person um, had their, their strong points, so we wanted to leverage that. Uh, you know, there were some of us more, more knowledgeable with backend stuff or, or, or JavaScript as opposed to the uh, Angular or HTML, CSS. Um, and, then, and then next on to that, we, 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 during the development process, we, we kind of used that microservices architecture where we all kind of focused in on our own modules, per se, and then exposed all that uh, uh, via API. Um, some of these algorithms that we had to write for the analytics, those were, um, we wrote those ourselves. We're not leveraging any third-party APIs for that. Uh, so that was, that was a, a good challenge in, our, in it as well. And Mr. Uh, Miguel back there wrote those. Um, during our testing, uh, we were testing for, for making sure that we're, our data was accurate and uh, the, the messages were posting in our Spark room and, and um, uh, making sure we were able to access all our APIs. And, and there was, we, were getting, we noticed that at one point uh, it was very difficult to query the, uh, the database uh, server as it was getting um, a lot, a lot of data and it didn't want to return any of that. It was actually crashing during, during that. So we had to kind of hash that out. And then now we're here, presenting in front of everyone, demoing our product, um, kind of uh, sharing this experience, our experience here at uh, DevNet with you all. Um, it was a great experience. Um, it was, for most of us here, this is kind of our first time ever doing something like this. So uh, we all learned a great amount of, uh, you know, kind of how it works working in a, uh, a group like this. So this is our front end app, as you can see. Uh, this is our top three. Uh, at, at this snapshot in time, this is our top three, uh, the events. Um, you can see Mr. Matthew Girardi. I, I, I wanted to highlight him. He, this is random, too, by the way. So the, the fact that his, his, his name came up, that's good, because he actually helped us out during our, uh, our app. So I wanted to highlight him. Um, <laughs> uh, so And then some, some more information that we decided to uh, present. Uh, this is our list of events, the top 10. Uh, and then we can see kind of the, the amount of people that, that actually uh, visited that particular event. And then down here, we have a list of tags. These are the most uh, popular kind of buzz, buzzwords at the time. And then this, uh, our venue attendance map, uh, we didn't actually get to finish that, but uh, that will eventually one day uh, be able to upload the venue map and then place all the APs on there and then get all the analytical data and build the, build the heat maps for, for the particular venue. Uh, is there anything else you guys want to add? Oh, that's right. And we, we do, we do want to talk about our, our, we can show you our Spark, uh, our spark room. So it's, it's kind of live, it changes the count. Right. Go up to the Spark room right there. Yeah, so here's our uh, Spark room. So th theoretically, we would have a, uh, uh, go up to the top one right here. Yep. So uh, when users pop onto the guest network, they would hit a custom splash page, which then auto enrolls them into this global event space. And then um, currently, the bot is set up to, to, send, to query the database every 30 seconds and go ahead and give us the top three uh, events at that, at that snapshot in time. Um, like I said, I, I do envision this being a little more sophisticated. For example, I found myself walking around wondering what the agenda was. And um, what, you know, I'd, I'd love for this guy to, to be able to if someone asks for the agenda, to go ahead and pull the agenda up. And, and so that's one, one, another use case off of that. And then, um, what else we got? That's pretty much it, right? Too much live change. 
Okay, and that's right. And then here's our here's our actually raw data that, that we, we we dealt with with Meraki. Um, so we were we had to parse all this data, and we were uh, I think towards the very end we ended up getting. Um, uh, 170,984 uh, counts of data. So you can see there's, there's a bunch of data getting this. That's what the data actually looked like. Can't really see it if you can zoom in. Can you zoom in? Yeah, this is actually after the data parsed. Uh, so that's not the raw data directly from Meraki. This is where we've already manipulated it and parsed out all that we wanted. And then uh, we're pushing that to the database and then doing some analytics on it as well. <coughs> I think so. Yeah, I think that concludes this. I appreciate you, uh, you all taking the time here. Thank you. All right, uh, are there any questions? Yeah, if, if, if I wanted to sign up for this, for my conference, is there a, a design for, for how I would you know, create my event? Go ahead. Or, sure. Here. We'll share the, the source code in GitHub, so you can just grab it there and install in your own servers. And you just configure your Meraki infrastructure there, and uh, you're ready to go. It's open source. <laughs> so could you keep track of how long someone spent at a certain talk? Yeah. Yes. Come and go? Yeah. We. We did not, we didn't that individually. We just aimed from five and five minutes, see how many people is in the conference to see the trending. So at the beginning, you can have a lot of people there. And then at the end, you, you end with one or two people. So we just track that that way. That's one of our algor algorithms. And we can put it in a graph also. It's available in the GitHub. No. Not all the solution yet. Yeah, not the whole. I, so I can't, yeah. yeah, it's partially there. All right. Are there any other questions before we move on? No? All right. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Give me the mics. Um, is team roll call ready? Yeah? No? <laughs> um, we are going to be cutting it really tight, and I apologize for some of the technical difficulties, so if you guys can hurry it up. Um, one thing I wanted to note, I'm noticing that there have been some pivots over the last two days from the use cases that, that we uh, had laid out for them, expected them to hit, and then the things that, uh, that they moved into. So that was one of, the, um, one of the teams that had to pivot as part of their use case, and they actually mentioned that as, as part of their presentation. So um, we saw that with uh, the uh, retail stat bot as well. Um, and I think we might see some, something similar with... Uh, with our team here, they, the use case that this team worked on was um, education roll call. Again, another kind of tracking application that, that uh, brings in students when they enter a, a, a room um, to be able to collaborate with other students in the, in the teacher in that space, um, but also make sure that they're actually in class. Um, so are you guys good to get mirror your? Yeah. And then we should be good to go. Mics? There's a mic for you. It's like slowly the students stopped coming, but they sent their recorders. Their recorders. We can probably camera versus face recognition. Oh, there we go. It's up. You're good. All right, cool. That's what they're doing. You just have a camera you can see everybody that comes in. Yeah. Hello? Yep, good to go. Okay. All right. uh, we are team uh, roll call. Uh, I chose this because my wife's a teacher, yeah. so it's yeah. something that, you know, I think has a lot of uh, challenges and a lot of good things that could happen with technology, and they're yeah. kind of slow yeah, to adopt. Sure. So uh, hopefully something like this could be used in the real world, and I see other use cases besides education for this uh, flow that we've built. So if we could all introduce ourselves. Okay. So uh, my name is Neshad Pereira. Uh, I'm working in a company called Databox at Houston. Uh, so I'm actually uh, new into this uh, 
the app development business with the uh, networking gear and all this uh, programmable networking stuff. So we started uh, building up some customer demos uh, with integrating different different platforms with uh, APIs and uh, showcase them the power of APIs to the customer so that they can have a lot more than individual uh, systems alone. So, uh, and I, uh, I hear about this camp create and I thought it's a good idea to uh, join them and see uh, what we can do. Uh, and since I'm a new, uh, new to this area, I'm actually uh, kind of like the, the, the youngest uh, person in this group, so the others are way ahead of me, but uh, I, I think uh, we did something work. I mean, finally got something work, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, so I, I highlighted everybody's language in here just to show that we're coming from different backgrounds here. We're not all Node.js or Python. I know no Python whatsoever. Uh, haven't done any Java since college. Uh, so I think we put it all together, and it was definitely challenging, uh, especially with the timeline and our other commitments within the conference. Uh, our second participant. Okay, uh, my name is Martin Garcia. I'm, I work for Cisco. Um, I'm a, I have like 15 years in software development. Uh, the last four or five years, I have been uh, working more in uh, data science and machine learning, uh, Python, a little of Splunk, stuff like that. Um, I like the challenge. I like to do development. So, uh, and I never has participated in anything like this. So, I enrolled this to. You know, to learn something new and to, to enjoy. All right. My name is Jared Rhodes. I'm a Microsoft MVP for the Microsoft uh, Azure Cloud and uh, Xamarin Certified Developer. And I have no idea, uh, or at least I didn't before Camp Create, of any of the Cisco products, what they did, how they were utilized or anything in that space. So my purpose for being here was I had a client that, uh, that was doing edge computing. Cisco has an edge platform, and they wanted to know how to use that with Microsoft. So I came out to Camp Create to learn with everyone else. And just to talk about how we all knew different stuff and had to be siloed from each other as we developed. I know C Sharp, Xamarin. Um, I know very little JavaScript. I know Python. And we wrote uh, the back end in Node.js. So that's me. I'm Jeff Levensailer. I uh, started programming uh, in college a little bit and then kind of went away from that and went down like a CCIE path and, you know, it, it kind of met back up with me, like a lot of things. Uh, so I've mainly for the last year or two uh, been doing uh, Node.js because that's what all the SDKs are written in. Uh, I kind of picked that over Python for whatever reason. but and. Probably for the last six months, I've been really interested in DevOps and pipelines and, and how to take the code we were working on uh, internally and instead of deploy it as like an OVA and hope it works, uh, have some kind of continuity between people and working together. And one of the most challenging things about this project was uh, as a developer, I usually write code at night by myself on my own laptop <coughs> and working with uh, other people uh, correctly with Git uh, was definitely challenging. Like, uh, I know Martin had, you know, a lot of stuff going on on his laptop that was uh, completely working, uh, kind of sectioned out as, as best we could do, but uh, I think we put it all together. <clears throat> so. The basic use case is a student enrolls in class. They already have uh, some information about being in the school system. So they're enrolling in this one class. And the best way to get that done is through a Meraki splash page, which I didn't think about. But it's a great use case for uh, capturing information and then redirecting them to another page. And at the same time they capture information, you can add them to a Sparkspace. Uh, with the Meraki API, which I never messed with before uh, today. Uh, you can either do coordinates or uh, the AP that the client has joined to, but it's a good way to bring the physical space into the virtual space. So we kind of had uh, 
two database collections going, one for students that captured the student's uh, email address and tagged that with their first and last name that was on file. And then we had a array of devices that were seen on the network when they signed into the splash page and an assignments array. And then our classrooms is the physical space. That's the, uh, each classroom is a Spark ID. Uh, it has an array of students and teachers. <clears throat> so this is just a example of our database schema and you know, we have our email address there and then some devices that uh, have logged in as this user. And then our physical space uh, for each uh, Spark ID, which is unique for each physical space, we have the uh, AP Max that uh, that classroom is tied to. So a lot of this is back end as you see, so uh, I wish we had it all working as an example, but just uh, for this use case, we're calling an API with the Spark ID, which is the classroom, and it's returning an array of students currently in that classroom. <coughs> this could be done via a bot or, okay. Yes, um, so uh, in the background, there is a, a process running, uh, receiving the data from uh, Meraki, um, uh, capturing all the MAC addresses of all the devices in the network. Um, in the other side, we have a, in the database, we have uh, the email address of all the students, the MAC address to all of the students. That's the way that we link, right? Email address to, well, multiple MAC address. And then we have in the database the classrooms. And in this case, to simplify, uh, the AP the MAC address of the access points that is in the classroom, assuming there is one, two, or more, right? So this process is running, and when when uh, we were, what we were trying to do is create a boot in Spark where the teacher can just basically say, okay, I'm going to list the, the, the students that are right now in my class, right? Let's say it's, it's 5.15, okay, it's time to take attendance, make the list. I run this boot, it, make, it give me the list of the users, right, that are right now in the room. What, what it's doing is, it's basically getting all the in this classroom, it's getting all the access points registered in this classroom, and then it's getting the list of MAC addresses and the last known position, right, based on Meraki. So based on that, the, the MAC addresses which the access point, the closest access points to them is the access points in the classroom, we assume that that student is in the classroom, right? So. Um, we did it, it's just uh, the API is there, it's just that we, we didn't have time to create the boot, but um, when the boot calls this API, it will get the, the list of uh, students in the class based on that. So just to say how close we were, <laughs> we have the array of students, we would iterate over that array and we would invite them to a space, one-to-one -one space, we would uh, do a message saying, please submit your assignment, if that's what we're doing at the time. Uh, they would uh, submit their assignment through an attachment. We get that attachment and store it in the database. Uh, and that database could be read uh, with a web interface to show who is in class at the time and all their attachments. And uh, kind of a stretch goal, because we had uh, Jared on board, is the facial recognition about that? So for facial recognition, we got it um, questionably working. So what we did was we went in Meraki and we set a custom splash page for the, um, for the sign in. So what we did was on that custom splash page, you could upload a photo. So we did it on the phone so that when you press take a picture, it opens the front facing camera and you can see your face. And I'm not showing you all this and I'll explain why because a, we don't have a USB-C cable to plug in the phone that we need to show. And uh, B, because it seems to be limited in what the browser will allow you to do in that uh, page. So you could upload the photo, and we used a, a preloaded set of data. So we took a picture of each one of us, and we put our student information up in uh, the facial recognition service. And if we take a picture, it will actually verify who the person is who's trying to sign in to the access point. Um, the limitations are, though, is that the browser doesn't appear to, um, well, I'll say on iOS, I can't figure out if the 
upload photo button is hyperactive, but it just closes the login screen every time you try to press the button on iOS. Um, if you do it on Android, it will not launch unless you can open the Wi-Fi access screen in the browser. It won't actually open the camera in that lockdown screen. So while it's a wonderful idea, it seems to be literally blocked by the OS to let you do it. But we did get it to work to where we could sign in on a Android phone that allows you to launch the sign-in screen in a browser. Just uh, speak a little bit about the deployment, the tools we used. Um, Meraki, Mongo, Cisco Spark, obviously, Node.js, Docker, Python. And we actually, before we got here, we had a little pipeline going. So you push it to GitLab, it does a Docker and Docker Compose, and then it upgrades the stack on Rancher. And that's kind of a high level what that is in my nodes. And do we have time for a quick demo or? Yeah, demo. demo. Yeah, and also if we can do a screen, if we can do a uh, something like just show it on his phone through the webcam or something, we can show it signing in with the facial recognition. Okay. Uh, so the big thing about our group was trying to get everything done about five minutes ago without really putting a presentation together. <laughs> that looked like a presentation. It was. It was. Uh, Jeff did a great job right over there getting it all together at the end. <laughs> Why am I not? While Jeff's getting the demo up, can you guys uh, ask some questions? And Jared, maybe you can field this. So I guess, again, it was mentioned earlier, rather than requiring picture. I mean, once the pictures are up, if you have a camera in the classroom, you could scan the whole classroom and, and do face recognition, right, with OpenCV or something like that. You, so we're um, using cognitive services from Microsoft again. I'm a Microsoft guy, so we're using cognitive services. So you can actually do that. What you do is there's, there's a two-part process. One, you send it a request with the picture and say, where are the faces? And it'll give you an outline of every face that's in your picture. Then you cut those back up, and you send them up, and you say, in this classroom, because you're going to preload a group of people and train against that group of people. So you have every student in the class preloaded. And when you uh, send each one up individually, you'll check each individual person and say, is this person, you know, who is this? And then you can do it against whatever roll call you want to. Are you familiar with the Cisco room, like what they're doing with telepresence today? Because you can count the amount of faces in the room. If somebody turns around, they're not counted as, you know, the camera doesn't point towards them. And you can actually, you know, snap their face. And if you say you're in a meeting, you're actually in the meeting. So it's, it's happening in the business world. Okay. I'm not a Meraki yet, but I got my Meraki box. Is it right that I hear from one of the other presentations that even if I'm not logged in or doing something, you're tra you can pull MAC addresses? Through, through the Bluetooth Low Energy, if you're... Sorry. So you, you mean, sorry, uh, you mean the, even if you're probing? Like if I carry my phone into a Meraki yes. place and I'm not logged in with an app to a store or a bank, Yes. It still is tracking my MAC yes, address? Yes, but that's in any Wi-Fi, right? It's not just Meraki. Got it. it OK. Yeah, so uh, Mac, um, uh, sorry, Mac. iOS, iOS does something different. They, uh, iOS actually hide the MAC address when you're probing. So it will, okay. we have tested. Sometimes it's actually send the real MAC address. But if you're probing, it will kind of like random, randomize some of the MAC address. So it's harder to track. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Android, pff, yeah, you, 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 I mean, we, we know where you are. And um, then it tracks. <laughs> so if I turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Yeah, no, no. If you have the Wi-Fi on, right? I'm talking it. about Wi-Fi. If you have the Wi-Fi on, uh, you have your device. Even if you are not connected, your device is talking to the APs, right? It's sending probing packets saying, hey, I'm here, I'm here. That's sure. you you Got recognize. It. Yeah, but that's true. So we didn't have authentication on this, and we were uh, kind of looking at some logs, and we realized there was like 300 people connected to our test SSID, so we had to turn this on. But So if I join this network, it should uh, give me a splash page. Uh, are you running your, are you online?
fingers. Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> He's got one of the new Macs, so there's everything's a dongle. What do you need? Do you need a? I got I got an adapter. There is a USB C adapter up there. <laughs> I think we need Thunderbolt. Oh, okay. Apparently, that is not what we need either. No, we need. Is that USB C or? Yeah. There it is, right there. This is this is USB C. Is Guy Kawasaki here so I could talk to him about the uh, direction of Apple products? There's a whole bunch of things right there. <laughs> it's a universal. One. I knew we had it. There we go. Okay, Woohoo! I think by now we've all learned that uh, how to make your screen mirror. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the the uh, the student comes to the college uh, Wi-Fi and um, it it logins to the Wi-Fi, so it will see this splash screen that we created from Meraki. Uh, at this point. Meraki is capturing your MAC address, so it's going to ask you to enter your email address, right? So when, um, when I click Connect here, what is going to happen is um, it's going to send this MAC address to a database, and it's going to link your email with the MAC address. So now we know every time you come, I see your MAC address, I know who you are, right? Now, that doesn't mean you are in the class, right? That in the classroom. I know you are in the Wi-Fi. I know you are in the building, right? Um, so then what is going to happen is uh, we record that, and then we are tracking, tracking you all the time where you are. And what we do is we track the closest access points to you, right? So based on that, if I query the, the API and say, okay, where is this person? And it tells me, oh, the closest API is this one, then I'm going to assume you are in this room. There are better ways to do that with triangulation, but obviously we didn't have time to, to do all that, right? Um, so there is no an, an, an next page where what happened right now is it will show or well anyway um, <laughs> it's hard to do the demo like this um, um, it create a spark room right uh, with the student right and, and um, welcome him we just added Paul Giblin to the space and welcomed him to class <laughs> cool Um, and that, that, that's it. Well, what you get? Hold on. One moment. Hold on. We also would like to take even more of your time to demo the facial recognition on sign-in. Oh, okay, sweet. We'll see how it works on this. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have to try it about five different connections. We're going to see if we can plug the phone directly in just for science, just in case you all ever have to present after us. So while they're plugging that in, I would like to point out that. Yeah, it's at HDMI connected. Keep in mind that they have done all of the things, all the projects you've seen have been built over two days. So the amount of work and the, the fact that some of these things even work at all is just truly amazing. Um, so uh, We had a, like a three-hour merge conflict. <laughs> and that can cause a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we used this one, right? The first one, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, you guys looked way more stressed. So when you connect from noon on, <laughs> so you get this splash page. But the problem with this splash is that you can't really take the picture by clicking on this button. It doesn't work that way. So I'm going to open it in the browser. Luckily, my phone let you do that. But uh, some other phones, there's no way you can do that. So I'm going so to. So we actually my email saw address. the splash page come up when and file. The wife. Okay, it's going to see my face. <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, and click connect. Okay. <coughs> Did I click? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, it takes time. It takes time because we are using NGROC to uh, tunnel the traffic, and NGROC is extremely slow in this case. And we're actually using free services in the cloud, so they all have to spin up. So now, actually, now you have to look at uh, his 
backend to see whether it's actually showing anything. Just yeah, plug. You get that one up. 200 OK, see it works. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we're yeah, looking for every day. Right? Yeah. But, uh, so what it's doing is, again, it's pulling down, and we're actually just returning the email address of the person whose face we just had. And that was the email address that we just sent hitting the facial recognition. So it can actually detect that it was him. So, uh, now hold on. We are going to show, uh, we are going to log in with someone else's face and see that you're getting the different email address here. But you'll have to trust us that we're doing that, because we're not doing this thing again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a play-by-play. -play. So we're logging out. So, yeah, you can see, uh, like that. <laughs> okay. okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, connect. And I hope it'll pop it up this time. Yep. Oh. Okay. He, he typed in the password wrong. I'm still giving you a play-by-play. -play. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now we've got the splash screen. We're going to open the splash screen in the browser. I have I just to go and do this step now. Unfortunate step, but you have to do that. Now, who's going to be the lucky guy? Okay. Jeff. Don't worry about the email. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because we're actually getting the email address from. Okay. All right. Okay. So, sending it to the cloud. And you will see something momentarily. We hope. We hope you see something momentarily. No. no. It did not think that was him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that was a good demo. I think we should uh, go and give you the rest of your day back. <laughs> Cut your losses, boys. <laughs> uh, thank you very Oh, uh, were there any questions? Sorry to rush it through here. We have one more team. And I know we're running way over. You good? Okay, cool. Thanks. All right, come on up, guys. Hey, you're all slowed down, guys. So, oh, mics, 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 mics. All right, last but not least, they actually asked to go last, which makes me nervous. Because uh, I know that John has some Machiavellian. Oh, that's not good. Yeah. Hopefully, it still works. Uh, so these guys are doing uh, server management and monitoring. Um, I know that doesn't sound super sexy, but it's something that is a very real need in the world, and I'll let John McDonough tell you more about it. Oh, before John talks, I'm sorry. I forgot to recognize Tessa as one of our hosts as well, so I apologize, Tessa. <laughs> I know, I busted. Good. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here. Did I broke it? Okay. Testing. Hello. Oh, the battery came loose. All right. Hello. Is it okay? <laughs> We're ready. Yeah, you got. We're ready, guys. This is a story of innovation in server management and monitoring. A story, a journey from the past to the present. A story where innovation transformed lives. Let's take a look at how server management and monitoring used to be when the customer from Acme Corp called their server management help desk. Hello, UCS Corp. Hello? This is UCS Corp. How may I help you? I'm calling you all the way from Nigeria. I can't access my server. What's it, going on? Is it Peter from Nigeria? Yes, this is Peter from Nigeria. I can't access my server. What's going on? What is the server name? It's server one. Server one? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK, let me go check it. Check it. I'm going to go to a data center room right now. OK? So it's going to be quite loud, OK? <laughs> so I look at it. Oh, there's a fault light on. So this is a couple of times already. So let me tell Peter. 
Hey, Peter. Um, looks like your server is dead. I need to. <laughs> I need to uh, take the serial number and RMA. It's, it's probably gonna take two or three days. Um, sorry about it. Oh man, you guys are killing me. <laughs> no. Well, keep me up, keep me posted. Okay, sure. Sorry about it. You don't want to be that guy. So okay. let's see what happens when the same call comes in today at UCS Corp. Hey guys, Peter from Acme called and he can't access his website. I think server one seems to be down. Hey Raj, can you check on the status on server one? Let me check on the UCS using power tool. Let me check on the UCS using the power tools. Something is going on with the server one. So I think Raj, there should be some better way to do this. Uh, can you take the help of Alexa today? Let's do it. Alexa? Ask UCS Monitor. Sorry, guys. Audio glitch. Go ahead. Are there any problems on server one and chassis one? Just hold the mic up to it. For the domain, there are 15 UCS blades. Start again. Okay. We're gonna start over for the audio bit, sorry. Alexa, ask UCS Monitor. Welcome to the Alexa app for UCS management. You can ask things like, what is the fault count for domain one? Or you can ask what is the fault count for server three and chassis two? Or provision <coughs> a web server. Are there any problems on server one, chassis one? For the queried UCS blade, there are, Five faults. Thank you. So, Raj, I think we can. So, we may have to, have to RMA the server. Uh, do you have the serial number handy? Oh, uh, no. We may have to take the help from maybe Spark. Yeah, so I think I have a better way to do this. So, let's use SparkBot we created uh, called UCS Monitor. So, um, So what I have here is a UCS bot. I can't, for, I forget the command, so let's see what I can do to fire up the help here, right? Taking a few minutes here. Oh, okay, I can find the serial number using the get simc serial command, so. Get simc serial server one. This may take a few minutes, so let me go have some coffee. <laughs> Got it. Oh, that's right. That's two coffees. All right, there you go. So we got our seal number. Hey, Raj, so can you go and physically locate the server so that we can unrack it and RMA it? Sure, I'll go, go ahead. I want to find the location. Is there a location I can find out? Do you know that? Sure. Um, let's ask Alexa for, sorry, she woke up again. Let's ask Alexa for uh, the serial number or uh, turning the LED status on. Alexa. Ask IMC monitor. Welcome to the Alexa skill for UCS IMC management. You can say things like, set server one's LED state on, or set server one LED state off. You can also get the state of the LED by asking, what is the LED state on server one? To retrieve a server serial number ask, what is the serial number on server one? 
set server one state on. So what you're seeing here is the um, SIMC, which is the ILO port for the... I have set the LED state to on, on okay. server one. Okay, so as you can see here, the locator LED has been on. So this is a visual indicator on the front and the back of the server. Um, so we can be turned on and off via API or on the back end we're, you know, um, setting some APIs to turn that on. So there you go, Raj. You can go now and uh, unrack the server for RMA. Thank you. Okay. So if that is the case, let us provision a new server uh, through Alexa, and we can try to save the life of Peter. Okay. Alexa, <coughs> ask UCS monitor. Welcome to the Alexa app for UCS management. You can ask things like, what is the fault count for domain one? Or you can ask what is the fault count for server three in chassis two? Or provision a web server. Provision a web server on domain one. The server provisioning has started for the specified UCS domain. I will send the server IP address, credentials, and DNS name to the UCS administrator's Spark room when the server provisioning is complete. Thank you. You're <laughs> welcome. You're the best. No, you are. No, you are. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we saved Peter's day, so let's call human. Um, I think we are ready to call Peter and give him an update. Yeah, that should be the case, yeah. Hey, Peter, are you there? Yeah, hi. You might have guessed. Okay, so, well, uh, sorry about uh, earlier, but right now we can provision it quickly and then without uh, RMA. So your server is running on a completely brand new hardware. So please go check yourself and then make sure everything is good. Ha, huh, all right. That feels like good news. Uh, you guys rock. I love doing business with uh, UCS Corp. <laughs> thank you, thank yes. you. So, thank you, guys. We are not really you know, prepared for this drama. This is something <laughs> we came up at the very last moment. So we apologize for any... Um, problems we faced earlier. So I have a few things to cover before we quit this show. Huh. End this meeting. Just share that one. Share that one. Okay. okay, they're coming up. Yeah, keep moving. You are there for a second. Yeah. Sorry, I should be looking. Okay. So this was our topic, UCS server management and monitoring. Um, so this is traditionally handled through UCS manager, or you go individual UCS servers to manage and monitor. Uh, what we demonstrated the first phase was how we did it in the 80s or 90s. Um, it took two hours or three hours to get a server spinned up before you can you know, talk to your customer about, hey, we are back in service. Um, and what we showed later was how we can do this better with UCS being already out there, what APIs are available to do, uh, do a better way of achieving those goals. So um, what we have done is it makes the UCS operation management very simple and efficient. Um, there is voice activated um, ways of uh, interacting with UCS, there is Spark, as an application that you can ch chat and intera interact with them. Um, and then you can repeat and scale this for a multi-site, you know, multi-cloud environment if you want to. Um, this is the team. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, I'll start myself. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Sankar. I'm a solution architect for CDW. Um, 
let me jump right to those slides so I can run through. Um, so I'm a CCIE in collaboration. Uh, I sell Cisco UC, um, and I'm a Spark ambassador, Spark master, uh, and I've been developing for three years on Node.js. Yeah, obviously. All right, Human Cheng, um, he's the He-Man. As you, I don't know if you guys have watched the show, uh, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, uh, one of my favorite shows. Um, he's a sysadmin for you know uh, Cisco, um, and he works on DevOps. Um, and Peter, he's the Prince Peter from Nigeria. He's the guy who keeps sending all those spam emails. Um, he works for Code Three, um, and then. Raj works for Cisco as well. He's a uh, um, Nexus product line, you know, uh, tech lead developer for that uh, group. And then Chox is uh, with advanced services with Cisco as well. And last but least, we got our mentor and our boss, the godfather, John. <laughs> you, you guys know him. And he's the reason why, you know, I, th I think I've been coding by myself for the last three years, and I've never worked in a team, so this opened my eyes to the, that type of working in a team together, right? So we split the division of Spark coding was done by me and uh, Chox and uh, Peter, and then John led the team for um, anything on the Alexa front, talking to the UCS. Um, I got one more slide and on the architecture and we'll wrap. So Alexa talks to Amazon Cloud, which we have something called as Amazon Lambda that we are leveraging. It runs Node.js, Python, whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and that function can go talk to a physical UCS data, uh, which is in the Cisco data, Cisco data center, uh, which is behind a firewall. So one of the biggest challenges we had were trying to get into the Cisco data center, right? Um, so what John has done is uh, put a VPN tunnel from Lambda all the way back to uh, a virtual machine running on those UCS servers, and then you know we can touch that infrastructure. Um, Hence the word. And what I did on the Spark uh, front was the Spark bot would uh, use a Flint-based infrastructure that talks to a Raspberry Pi sitting at my home, and then any type of a command you type on the Spark room uh, again goes back to the same infrastructure, right? So two different ways to interact. You could use Google Home. You could use whatever out there. Um, but I think that's, that's all I had. All right, cool. We have time for about two questions, um, if you guys would like, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Okay, um, one of the things that I like from your use case is that you can actually then tie not only for the internal IT, but you can also do self-provisioning for the customer. So for example, tie that to a Sparker and the virtual assistant and you have a way for the customer to go ahead and ask for a new server without you having to do it um, by yourself. So that, that's, I think, is a good use case as well. Absolutely. I think, I think any VR or AR-based systems or uh, voice recognition systems can interact. So it could be the Spark Assistant. Um, even great idea. Anyone else? We're good? All right, cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, we want to get all of the Camp Create team members on stage for a quick photo, and then we're going to just go straight into our closing ceremonies, all right? So thank you so much. Thank if you everybody so much. Camp Create can come up, thank you for all your work. We'll give you a quick round of applause and take a quick picture. Thank you so much. Come on up. Come on up. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Yeah, mentors too. Mentors, hosts, all the all those guys. All right, left to right. <laughs> Did we get everybody? Are we missing anyone? So this is our first inaugural Camp Create. Um, the the presentations indicate how uh, kind of raw some putting some of these technical things can be together. So we had a lot of technical difficulties, but we got all the demos running, I think. Um, and a uh, big hand for these guys. Thank you. So everyone smile for a picture, and that's that. <laughs> All 
Go DevNet. Yeah, OK, cool. Thank you, guys. Huh? We can take one more break. No. <laughs> Everybody? Okay, uh, we are going to go right into our closing ceremonies. So if, if you're hanging out in the breezeway waiting for the closing ceremonies to start, we are going right into those instead of taking a break. Um, we In the closing ceremonies, we're going to have some more giveaways at the end. And this time we're doing computer history trivia since we're in the computer history museum. So get your computer history trivia hats on. All right, thanks. And here's Susie. Are you ready? Great. Yep, all set. All of these. How do you guys feel? Oh. <laughs> Are your brains full? Your brains full? No, you want more? David, I want more. You guys want more? <laughs> Excellent. So thank you. It's been an amazing two days here at CREATE. And I want to thank you all for jumping right in and just engaging. The thing that was really, I guess, inspiring for me is to see all of you out there connecting, engaging, learning, coding, doing all sorts of new things. So what I wanted to do is just quickly take us back to a little bit of the opening. And I'm just going to go through a few things really quickly to remind us of what I presented before to kind of get your feedback on where we are today and just see, how it, see what it all meant to you. So we started out by talking about how in the last 25 years, it's been all about connection, connecting everything. And now that we're in an entirely new world where everything is connected, it's really about this era of creation. And as we have APIs, as we have developers, especially as we have developers from all different types of backgrounds, then the types of things that we can create today are just entirely new, and we can really transform the world ahead of us. Uh, in addition, we talked about how it's important to connect and protect to create, and that there's a lot that the infrastructure can do for you as we are trying to take that responsibility of providing a safe world, and we're we still have creation and innovation and in really bringing it all together as a community. We talked about how traditionally applications and infrastructure have been separate, but how with all of the advances in cloud and DevOps, cloud infrastructures and cloud applications are giving a whole new way for applications and infrastructure to work together. And that the thing that's changed is that now the infrastructure is programmable. And now that the infrastructure is programmable, it has APIs, we can use DevOps, and then now there's a whole new class of modern applications that can come together with this programmable infrastructure, and we can achieve so much more. And then we were even a little bit more specific and said that there's the network. And while the network used to just provide connectivity, it's a programmable network that has APIs. And as you do that, then there's network APIs and net DevOps that allow modern applications to get to an entirely new level as well. Um, there is actually a specific example of this that I want to uh, have Matthew share. We have Matthew from Mapwise. He's right over here. Uh, can we give him a microphone? Thank you. So uh, I think many of you met Matt. And Actually, one of the hackathon teams, or the Camp Create teams, thanked you because you were helping them with their APIs. <laughs> now, he has an application that's called Mapwise. And why don't you tell them a little bit about it? And I think it's interesting because it gives kind of a real life use case of how applications hit an infrastructure. And I, uh, you know, anyways, why don't you go ahead, Matt? Yeah, so th thank you. Uh, so we are developing Mapwise, and Mapwise is, is an indoor mapping platform. So the goal is really to bring the facility that we have outside with the digital maps 
uh, what uh, a guy was uh, speaking this morning, the map 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and we want to bring that but also inside of the, of the building. And so we are making all those tools for building maps, and we were really excited when we could work with the uh, APIs from uh, CMX and from Meraki to actually get the Wi-Fi to get us the position of all the devices that are there. So we can actually show your position on the map and also help you trace all the devices that you care about, all the assets that you have, and see on the map where they are. And it was interesting, because when I was speaking at Web Summit in uh, Lisbon, Portugal, I was talking about where applications meet infrastructure to a set of entrepreneurs and app developers. And then I wanted to give an example. And in the Web Summit app, it, MapWise was embedded in there. And it was using the Cisco infrastructure that was deployed. So I actually just used that as my demo, because it was the conference app. And uh, you know, as I uh, was talking to Matthew, he was talking about what did it take to install this and get it working at Web Summit? So why don't you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so it, it was a really interesting experience as well, because that was the, the, the first time that I got to, uh, to be there for the installation of a, of a network infrastructure. So most of the time, I'm coming more from the software development. And uh, uh, there, for, uh, so for, for Web Summit, we, uh, there were some APs that were already uh, in, the, uh, in the event center. But the, uh, the, the Cisco team and, and the local uh, team also deployed a few more hundreds of those, uh, of those APs. So I was there in the, in the cabling, in the configuration. It was really, uh, really interesting to learn about that. And, and, and that's a, a whole new world that's, that just opened up uh, for, the, for that. It was really interesting. Now, MapWise as a software company is not going to go around installing network infrastructures. But actually, there's many partners around the world that do exactly. and do this kind of thing. So it's just interesting to have your software come on top of the infrastructure. And I thought this was a, a really good example of where modern applications can meet a programmable network. And um, uh, also, you're saying, like, as you come to business, there's actually a deal that you are recently getting involved in with the help of Cisco. Yeah, so I, actually that was uh, the, uh, the, the really good thing about uh, having the, the relationship. And, and we want to thank you again, because the, the Web Summit uh, uh, speech th that we didn't expect at all. I mean, we were not even there to, to, to watch this. We were too busy <laughs> uh, making sure that everything was working properly. But that, that was really uh, also opening new, new opportunities. So uh, indeed, so far, there's been quite some communication with Cisco. And we managed to, uh, to make some, uh, some deals and to attract new clients. And, and like two weeks ago, we actually closed the first deal when one of the uh, Cisco resellers also resold MapWise to, uh, as, a, as a bundle because one of the uh, requirements of the customer would not be met only with the software and, and solution that they had available. So they actually decided to take an extra solution, and that's where the, the fact that we knew each other and we, uh, that they, they, they knew that we were working together really helped in, in closing that deal. So that's, that's really cool also for the business. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And uh, so when, when I spoke about kind of DevNet and the developer site, what we're trying to do next in terms of community contribution and a code exchange, and then what Guy said this morning is, what's a partnership? It needs to change your, needs to change your money, right? The money that in your business that you bring in. And that's why we announced the DevNet ecosystem exchange. Uh, you know, that's what we want to do, is that we want to help you get to market, get to business, using the Cisco ecosystem and community that's out there, bringing it together with our application developer ecosystem and marketplace that's out there. So there's a lot we can do. And actually, I was just talking to Matthew at, and heard about this story at the speaker dinner the night before we started Create, and he told me about it. And I'm like, yeah. you should give my keynote instead, because <laughs> that's exactly what we're trying to enable. So thank that, you very much. Thank you so much for having me here. <laughs> thank you. So I thought it would help you guys to hear that example. Does that make sense? Yeah, great. Um, so uh, so it's, an, it's incredible. Um, so I told you that DevNet here is here, and our mission is to help you learn, to help you code, to help you and all of us to get inspiration, and for us all to connect as a community. We talked about how it's much better to be skating when you have teammates watching your back, and you're going down together. And the celebration that happens there. And we were hoping that for this conference, we know that 
your career is a team sport. And we were hoping that we could all be part of Team DevNet, or as an ecosystem, we come together with application developers, partners, infrastructure providers to create something better. And our goal is to help all of you be successful. I'm curious, did any of you feel like you've met new people and connected with new people? Yeah? yeah? That's awesome, because that's what I wanted. And my inspiration was for all of you to come, feel that you're part of a new community, uh, and that we can all continue to help each other. And so uh, what I ask is that online, if everyone can go you know, after this and submit your feedback online, uh, because there's a lot of things and feedback that I've gotten from many of you. And as I said, as a DevNet team, what we want to do is really improve this. We have no reason to do this if it's not valuable to you. So all of the feedback that you give to us is something that we take to heart and we use it to design the next one. Last year, we got a lot of feedback. People love the workshops. We went from three workshops to eight workshops. Uh, you know, so all of this feedback is critical. Anything that you give us is what we'll take to the next level. But what I want to do now is actually bring up the lights in the room, and I want us to have a conversation and hear from all of you and hear some of the, you know, what did you learn from here? Who did you meet? Uh, what kinds of stories? What was your favorite workshop or presentation? So I just want to open it up so that we can get some conversation going. Uh, the more that you contribute, the more interesting this little section will be. So don't be shy. Go ahead and speak. All right, we're going to be running around with the mics. Anybody want to share? What did you learn? Yes. So I think, you know, I was part of Can Create, so sorry, losing my balance here. <laughs> um, so we were locked in two days into this whole thing, so we did not get to attend any sessions. So, so I don't know if this make it a four-day session. I don't know. It's too much to ask. And B, um, Can Create guys were wanting some more quieter space. Especially Alexa was hard to work with in a noisy environment, right? So I think those are my two things. But uh, I learned to work in a team today, so. Oh. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sankar. And, uh, and we did get feedback that some people asked for Camp Create to be separate, like two days before or after the workshop, yeah. Yeah. and people wanted to stay longer. Is that OK? Yeah. All right. And they, some people said they wanted to stay a week. So we'll look at that for next. You got anything? I just, I just want to say that, you know, uh, having this many engineers and brains in the room, how little of ego that I saw from everybody, and everybody was so open and just willing to share. So it's great. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, so I'll take that just a little bit further. I, I work for Presidio, so does Jeff over there. But one of the things that's great about an event like this is you can let that all drop, and it doesn't matter who you work for. At the end of the day, you are part of a community, and we're all here to share what we know and learn from other people who know more than us about different things. So it's, it's fantastic being able to participate in something like that. Thank you. So I'm a relative beginner new to uh, development and one of my biggest fears coming out here was not being able to contribute or not be like holding my team back and when I got here being able to sit around people who like just knew everything really well and were patient with me and were like you know what can you do what are you able to do can you work on this for a little bit what about ideas about this so it was really inspiring to me to be able to learn from people who have just an amazing amount of experience and, and knowledge to share and not feel so intimidated that I didn't want to, like I, like I want to come back again, like I want to do it again next week. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that, that was my experience. Thank I had you, a great David. time. Thank you, and if I can, um, well, David, it's great to see you in person. We have a history here. <laughs> uh, he's worked very hard to get here uh, with his personal life and his personal story. Um, but I want to thank you because it's the teammates. You just said that your teammates made you feel welcome. So that's not me, that's all of you, what you've all done for each other. So thank you for embracing that attitude and making people feel welcome to contribute. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sylvia. First, uh, thank you very much for setting up. This has been a wonderful experience. 
Um, I like two things. Firstly, I think the um, gamification of the workshops and the Black Hat Challenge was exceptional as well. Uh, and second, like the combination of uh, both Cisco technologies, but also learning how to integrate with things. For example, like Cisco Spark, but also like Postman or different applications, like integrating the both was really interesting. Excellent. And that was a key is that we didn't want to just teach Cisco technologies. We wanted to also give you the most modern software and web and cloud technologies out there. So I think that combination is, is stronger there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First time for me for the DevNet conference, I've been to multiple uh, unconference DevOps and the main DevOps uh, annually happening in Cisco. So definitely the developer conference should be bigger than this for the 10,000 plus people IOS we have and all the application developers we have since we are moving towards software transformation. We would like to see this grow more. Maybe next time we can have an app where we can see the agenda and we can sign up. And definitely we need to have the camp, uh, coding camp a little bit ahead or at the end of the conference so we can do that and definitely we want to share whatever we can uh, create with other audience also. So it was uh, nicely organized and big thanks to all the, all the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you another question? Is you've been to the other conferences, yeah. um, how does this uh, compare? Like, did you see a reason to be here given all the other conferences? Uh, yeah, definitely. So this is mostly developers oriented um, uh, and it much more open for us to absorb the technologies. We don't have to be worried about only Cisco products. We are open to learn other technologies and integrate. And more and more we are thinking about more and more open source that we have to adopt. And we have to expose our APA from our products to the partners and developers. So they are bringing the value on how they are going to consume with their partners and customers, which will not be there if you make it only Cisco internal conference. Because we never, as a, I mean, from engineering side after 18 years, we never used to meet customers directly unless you are part of a sales organization or uh, you are part of advanced services. So that perspective is really critical for us to really develop some software that makes a big value for customers. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Just uh, I'm Joel from Worldwide Technology. A comment about DevNet Create, the website, developer.cisco.com. I think you've done a really good job with the content that you have there. It's very consumable at the right level. There's always been, been a lot of work put there. Um, be kind of nice to see the metrics of how people are using that and how effective it is. I think it's a good tool. I hope, I hope people take advantage of it. Um, so I think that's very positive, and I tell a lot of that people within my company that it is, it is good. It, it, it does have good content, and it's very helpful if people want to take advantage of it. Um, la last year, you mentioned about you wanted this conference to be more for uh, users and customers, less Cisco. I think your balance is a little too much on Cisco being presenting here, and I'd like to see you kind of try to get more industry involvement in the presentations rather than, than the number of people that were from Cisco that presented. Okay. Out of the presentations or out of the workshops or both? Total, in total, yeah. Do you want more content or do you want it spread over a longer period of time? I, I think even of content, I, I'd, I'd kind of like to see more people from outside Cisco be, be, be the ones that enable the content. Yep, great, thank you. Yes. And, uh, and by the way, our goal I, was to have community-generated content mixed in with Cisco content. So that's very much aligned with the goal. And you're right, we can do more of that. Yes. Hi there. My name is Mahantesh. I work for Advanced Services. Uh, I'm a solution architect. I'm customer-facing. I travel 90%. Um, so this is much my first experience. Uh, food truck was good. There are long lines. The food trucks were good? Food trucks were good? Did you guys think the food trucks were good? No? But shorter yeah. lines, okay. Uh, having said that, I came to know so many things that uh, the DevNet evangelists really bring to the table. And a lot of my customers ask for a transformational journey. I thought I can pull in some of these guys like John or Matt. <laughs> Matt is getting his first baby, sorry. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you should enable us to talk to them and give us some time. So it, it, these are customer engagements, right? So yes. that's my ask. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, and to, to build on that, what I heard from many of you um, is that 
you know, there's all, like, these are really new areas. So when you talk about DevOps, when you talk about cloud, when you talk about IoT, and actually a number of you have asked to say, okay, so now I'm learning these new skills, but how do I transform my company? <laughs> or how do I transform the company that I'm working with? And it's more than the technical enablement, but it's almost like, how do I get us to innovate? How do I get us to disrupt? How do I get my company to ex explain and understand some of that? Um, so that was something that I heard from many people as well. So thank you. I, I just wanted to talk about two things. The first one is that it's a lot easier to actually have people, for example, Alex uh, Ellis from the OpenFast um, project. I had to, I spent like almost two hours talking to him and in the party, in the workshop. So it's, it's actually a luxury to have that kind of relationship and this conference allows that. And the other thing that I wanted to talk, it's, um, well, you know, I've been part of DevNet from the beginning. I've seen how open the DevNet team in general has been to contributions and to uh, open to feedback. So at the first it was just like, theoretical content, like just sessions, then you start doing the DevNet Express, then the workshops, then the DevNet create itself. So it's, it's, um, it's very good to see how you've been evolving, how you've been open to uh, contributions from, I mean, for example, I have presented last year and presented this year as well. So that's, that's, that's a very good thing from, from your team, how humble you are, how open to feedback you are. So from my side, hats off to you, and again, thank you for, for all the effort that you've been done in the past few years. Thank you, Jose. And uh, thank you to, to my team members as well. Thank you. Do we have one? Oh. Uh, uh, suggestions to this. Maybe the workshop room should be called the rest room next year with all the rest APIs that you. <laughs> No, I think one thing that's very interesting that we'll see, I think, in the next 12 months, 24 months, is a consolidation of the APIs that Cisco is using. I feel that some of the APIs that we have right now, like NX API, will probably go the way of ISL or CGMP. Cisco put something in place when the standards weren't uh, available. But looking at what the great teams did in the security space, in the network infrastructure space, in the presentations is uh, very exciting. What I'm seeing is a, you know, centric or a consolidation with REST throughout many of your uh, uh, products, and hopefully um, a, a greater uniformity with the data model. So if you can pass that on to the business units, don't develop your APIs independently, and I'm sure they're working on that, consolidate. And I think in the next 12 months when we come back, we'll see a more consolidated set of APIs. Thank you. We, we will. We're actually uh, working closer and closer to work on the API alignment and consistency between the products and the design there. So we'll see more. Thank you. Thank you. As a leader, uh, I'd like to see Cisco take an, uh, uh, a leadership position in, in outreach and making this conference more gender balanced. Uh, and you know, take a lead in that because we desperately need that in Silicon Valley. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I'll uh, just and, add. And, and I will. Oh, you're gonna. Okay, I, go ahead. Yeah, yes. I didn't want to, uh, no, I was just gonna add that we absolutely need to work on both the gender balance, the diversity and inclusion overall. And uh, this is um, our second year, and uh, I. We're going to be figuring out how to do that, and so I'd definitely appreciate your inputs on that, and we will work on that, absolutely. Yeah, and I just really wanted to add to that a little bit. Um, I was a participant in Camp Create. I also work for Cisco, but um, I've been following the DevNet team for quite a while, and so I wanted to kind of emphasize that there was a lot of prep work, um, so don't feel intimidated if you, know, you want to join in, but you don't have much coding skills. I didn't really have a whole lot of coding skills, actually really none. Um, but uh, I watch a lot of the modules that Hank did. I, you know, followed you and Mandy, and so it was really nice to see everybody in person, and then also kind of partner with more seasoned coders on my team to learn how to do the SparkBot or Spark. Thank bot. you. And uh, she did her SparkBot. It was in the hackathon. It worked. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Great, was there, oh, okay, one in the back of the room. Oh, 
Okay, we'll do these two in the back of the room and then those will be the last ones. Yes, I'm coming. Excellent. <laughs> Oh, uh, so this was my first uh, encounter with DevNet. Uh, I've used a lot of DevNet tools, but this is the first opportunity for me to be a part of a developer conference and uh, learn some, uh, learn some uh, really useful techniques for uh, a handling with APIs. Uh, thanks for all the sessions that were uh, held during this time. Uh, so uh, I think one feedback I would definitely have is uh, the spacing of the workshops. So in the way, uh, like, I understand that you only have like three sessions or four sessions per day. And uh, I also saw that a lot of work important workshops were like repeated multiple times. Uh, but I, uh, so, so like if I want to attend some like specific topics, uh, there were clashes a lot of times, which, uh, because of which I couldn't cover uh, some of the uh, topics which I wanted to cover. So I think one of the su suggestions coming from one of the members yesterday was to have a webinar that can be shared ah. after the, uh, workshop is done, so I think that could be a really good opportunity to like go back and maybe uh, cover the sessions which we could not uh, do because of the overlaps that happened in the sessions. Okay, will do. Uh, how many of you felt there were workshops or sessions that you couldn't attend but wanted to? Oh boy, okay, which is, which is good. So what we'll do is um, we'll have this set of feedback, but you know what, I'm gonna send out another form where we can list the topics and you can say, I wanna see this one online. And then we'll ask the speakers and see if we can have some you know, webinars or online broadcasts after that to try to make some of that happen. Thank you. I just wanted to say that, um, that this two-day conference felt luxurious. I, just to echo the word he used, um, not only because it was affordable, um, you know, it was almost nothing to come here for two days and attend this, but in addition, it was so much learning that was possible. And that's, actually, I wanted to say what he, what he said, that there was so much more that I wanted to attend that I couldn't because, you know, they were overlapping. I had to sit down and figure out which is the most important things, things like that. So it was um, really good, a lot of learning. It was easy to learn. I mean, the people who were at the workshops, the people who were leading that, they, you know, they were patient and, you know, in, in, teach, in walking through the steps and, so it was a great, really good experience. Thank great. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Are we? Yeah, and what I can just add to that is I know that, um, that this is kind of a signature of something that we've learned in the DevNet zones at Cisco Live and something that we expanded here was these smaller size workshops. But I know for presenters, they sometimes feel uneasy about it because you're expecting to come and present to a large group and yet the participants love the intimacy of the smaller size group. Um, how many of you thought that the workshops were too small in terms of size? And then how many liked the size? Yeah, okay. Okay, so we'll be, um, uh, anyway, figuring that out and you know, just setting expectations. So, because I think that's just a feature, people like getting hands on and getting that teaching and that relationship. Uh, so, so we'll be working on that as well. Great, thank you. Okay, so thank you everybody for the feedback. Oh, one more, yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Just uh, one final comment. Um, you know, the, the presenters were great and, and everything, uh, but I wanted to give a shout out to the people in the front office, you know, the information desk, the people organizing this because they were really, really great doing this stuff and it was a very fun um, conference and very well organized. So yeah, just wanted to give that shout out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. All right. Thank you. And now what we're gonna do is move into... Yeah, we're gonna do computer history trivia to give away a few last giveaways. So we've got um, six questions. John is going to MC these questions for us in typical John, John style. Um, <laughs> so we've got questions. These are questions that you could have possibly learned in the Computer History Museum exhibits downstairs if you had time to cruise through any of that today. You can also just guess, and we'll just keep going until someone gets it. Uh, when we were writing these, I asked my team to come up with some, and the first draft was 
insanely hard. Um, and so we did a revision, and um, you know, I, hope, I think these will be pretty fun. So, all right, so just raise your hand. We're gonna just randomly pick someone, and if you get it right, you know, then we'll, we'll give that to you, and if not, we'll go on to the next person, so, all right. All right, so don't shout it out. I am uh, Quiz Khalifa. I am the Quiz Master General. This is welcome to DevNet Create Quiz. Trivia. <laughs> All right, coming up right now, we got this question. The single most successful mainframe sister would, was released in 1964 and cost consumers about $133,000 US. Which company released the System 360? <laughs> All right, get that guy out of here. He's out. All right, come over here if you answer it right, and we'll give you your prize. Yeah? Oh, he's okay. out. We want to pick another one? No, we're good. No, 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 no I don't you're know. Good. Come on. Yeah, all right. Okay, winner. We'll just have you stand over here for a minute. All right, cool. Next one. I swear, if this was Jersey, we would have beat him out in the uh, in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not beat him, like you know, tickled him crazily or something like that. <laughs> The kinder, gentler Jersey. Question number two, Cumero numero two. Few technologies were as decisive in World War II as the top secret German encryption machine. What was that machine called? The Enigma. That is correct. <laughs> All right, question number okay. three. Number three. One company differentiated itself with recognizable exterior designs of the computer system itself, as well as supercomputing power. Which computer system was designed so that people could also sit near it on attached benches? This guy right in the back, you gotta go to him. Look, look how high that hand is raised. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I, yeah, Cray is right, Cray is right. What's that? Cray, New Jersey. What was that? I said Cray, New Jersey. That's right, Cray, New yeah, Jersey. I'm from Providence, so I know how you roll. That's how we roll. <laughs> awesome. Okay, go join our winners over there. Thank you. All right. All right, you should get a prize too. All right, question number four. You may know that Admiral Grace Hopper first coined the term computer bug in 1947. What insect was the first computer bug? It was a moth. That is correct. Johnny, Woo! what did he win? <laughs> is this side of the room getting love? OK, I think we need some love over here. Question number five. The Nintendo Game Boy released in 18. <laughs> 18, whoa. <laughs> in Wakanda. The Nintendo Game Boy, released in 1989, can be powered with how many AA batteries? Four. What up, man? That'll be four, sir. That is correct, sir. <laughs> All right. Last, last one? This is the last question. Last one. All right. And I will read Pressure's it as creepily on. as I read the other five. How many million punch cards stored the data for the 1890 census? How many million, million punch cards stored the data for the 1890 census? Remember, answer this question in the form of an answer. <laughs> All right, we've got a taker. Here we go. Let's say zero. That is correct. Six, zero, million. That, no, <laughs> that's a good guess. No, that's correct. 60 zero? million. He said zero. He what? Said zero. zero. <laughs> what? Uh, he said zero. He said zero. Wait, but there was someone over there who raised their hand. <laughs> he said zero? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, someone, yeah, everyone there, knows someone it. Someone over there had their hand. Okay, All right, right, it's not like it's the first technical difficulty of the day. <laughs> It is my hearing, and I did listen to Metallica at 11, that is volume 11, for most of my formative years, which is like up to right now. Oh, wow. 
We, and, and here we have... Well, the guy card. that actually has a punch Why card should punch probably card? get something. <laughs> you know, so we can make your own. I was going to guess 40. It's not just a punch card. It's his phone. He's uh, slow to uh, awesome. take up new technologies. All right. Well, thank okay. you, everybody. Thank you, yes, thank, you. thank you, everybody. Thanks to our women. I thought he said six zero. <laughs> there were no punch cards in 1890. Trick question. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. I want to just ask some, just a final question is, um, how many, because we have to plan for next year, uh, how many of you would come back again next year? OK. I think we're going to have to get more space. Or did you guys like the space here? Mm, okay, then we'll have to not invite anybody else. <laughs> Thank you all, everybody. Uh, you know, once again, the, the beauty here was really how engaged all of you were and how you all bonded as a community. And the thing that I ask is as we leave, please stay in touch. Stay in touch with each other. Stay in touch with us. You know how to reach us. We're all online. We're there. We're about the community. We're about you. So we want to continue to learn more about you. We want to make you successful, and we want to work together. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy. Thank you.